More than 30 nuclear facilities of varying sorts dot the Great Lakes Basin on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border. And with new facilities being proposed for the region, there's been renewed concern about the byproducts of this activity, especially something called radionuclides. Joining us now on that, Michael Rinker. He is Director General responsible for Environmental and Radiation Protection with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. John Marsden, Manager of the Great Lakes Issue Management at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Teresa McClenahan, Executive Director at the Canadian Environmental Law Association. And Mark Matson, President of the environmental group Lake Ontario Waterkeeper. Great to have everybody around our table here for this discussion about, in particular, a word which I suspect 95% of the people watching have never heard before. So we're going to get into that for, in a second. First of all, I, I need to know what you folks do. Michael, what do you do? So um, I'm with the regulator, the federal regulator responsible for regulating Canada's nuclear industry. And I lead a team of about 70 scientists and engineers who uh, review license applications and make sure that, uh, that Canada's nuclear fleet is uh, protected with the Great Lakes. Okay. Teresa, your group. So CELA, Canadian Environmental Law Association, is a legal aid clinic. We represent clients. We go to hearings. We do law reform and we do public education. And specifically on nuclear, I've been looking at emergency planning for the last few years, and we also look at drinking water safety. And you live tweet when you go to hearings. I do. The CNSC hearings, I live tweet. That's very helpful for some of us. Uh, okay, John, how about you? Well, my job at Environment and Climate Change Canada is to help implement the Canada-U.S. Uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and the Canada-Ontario Agreement on Great Lakes as well. Are you wetting your lips at the thought of trying to figure all this out in the era of Trump? Well, we, uh, we've been working with U.S. federal and state and tribal folks for the last 40 years. We'll continue to do so. Yeah. Very politic answer. Very good. <laughs> okay, Mark, finish us off here. Environmental lawyer. In uh, 2001, I became full-time waterkeeper for Lake Ontario. And um, I'm also I'm on the Great Lakes Water Quality Board of the IJC as well. And waterkeeper does what? We work hard to keep the Great Lakes and our fresh water swimmable, drinkable, and fishable. Gotcha. Okay, Michael, I used to, uh, suggested off the top anyway that we were going to talk about something that I suspect very few people have ever heard of, and the word is radionuclide. What is that? So radiation in general um, comes from radionuclides. Uh, it's a type of energy in the form of waves, streams of particles. It's all around us. It's in our backyard. It's in the food we eat. It's in each other. Then there's non, and there is ionizing radiation, um, which is really the subject that we're going to talk about now. That is higher level radiation. It has it can cause cellular damage. Must be regulated closely, and I think that's the topic that we're going to be talking about today. And that's where I follow up with Teresa. What concerns you about issues surrounding radionuclides today in Canada? Well, there are a number. There are a number of issues. So. Um, in general, we don't want people or the environment exposed to the high-energy radionuclides that can cause damage, as Michael was just discussing. And so that can happen in a whole host of ways. So yes, workers can be exposed during mining. Um, and in addition, we could have accidents where we have high levels of radiation energy in the environment, like Fukushima or Chernobyl, and, and that's a huge concern, which is why we worry about emergency planning. In addition, we have legacy wastes, and the fuel wastes can be very high energy for a very long time, and we have to protect the environment and people for hundreds of thousands of years from that kind of waste. Mark, you obviously have your focus on Lake Ontario. Are you concerned that there are radionuclides that are dangerous for people in Lake Ontario? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, when I started Waterkeeper, um, even before, we were doing a lot of investigations around Port Hope, some of the old sites, Port Granby, um, the Welcome site. These are old legacy waste sites and um, you know I do the sampling where the pipes would go out in the water and we brought that forward to the government but really why we did it and what we're most concerned about is it's very unique to have this industry on freshwater drinking water nine million drink the water Lake Ontario 45 million drink from the Great Lakes you know most of these industries elsewhere in the world and the International Atomic Energy um, Agency for example in their rules they apply with salt water seawater you're out you know not being drunk, drank or relied on as drinking water for such a huge portion. So I've always been arguing that we have to take extra care here. The Great Lakes needs its own special precautions when it comes to um, radionuclides, and we don't have that right now. We don't have that extra special um, protections that I think are warranted given um, how much we rely on the Great Lakes. John, do you agree we don't have those extra special protections that Mark would like to see in place? Well, my job is to look at... Uh the hundreds and thousands of chemicals uh, that are in the Great Lakes. So 
our department is assessing those coming up with those that are toxic under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, and then through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, considering with the U.S. what small set of chemicals we should focus on. And uh, we have uh, a nomination about radionuclides that we're taking a look at now. So uh, time will tell whether or not uh, it becomes a special uh, chemical. Let's just understand that. When you say there's a nomination in place right now, that suggests it's not on your list of one of the hundreds of thousands of chemicals that you are currently concerned about. Is that right? Well, Environment Canada has a, a memorandum of understanding with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. They are the lead on the, on the radionuclides. That's this guy here. Right. Okay. So that we, we can't have two uh, organizations regulating the same chemical, so they're the lead. So if they say to you, we are concerned about this chemical, then you put it on your list and it then becomes a thing? Is that how it works? Uh, well, not exactly. I mean, we'll get a recommendation from Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission about whether or not it should be a chemical of mutual concern in the Great Lakes. But we need to talk to the province of Ontario and we need to talk to the, the U.S. agencies to see if there's binational agreement. Do you think radionuclides should be a chemical that ought to be on his list? So first of all, I wanted to suggest that um, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada and Health Canada did do an assessment of the effects of radionuclides being released from Canada's nuclear industry. Mm -hmm. And they did conclude that radionuclides are not posing an imminent or long-term threat to Canada's environment or to biodiversity. What they did conclude is from a chemical nature of uranium it, um, being released from uranium mines, it did require extra management and we took that on. And uh, there were new release limits set and I'd say for a decade now the uranium mines are performing much better. Teresa, um, do you believe, to, sorry, you, I know you want to add something, but let me just, let's, let's check that first. They've had studies. They say the studies show this is not dangerous. You okay with so, those studies? So, no, actually not. Um, <laughs> we don't have good uh, assessment of the sum total of radionuclide threats to the Great Lakes, and that's been noted in studies out of the IJC since the 90s. We don't have um, collective monitoring because we haven't designated a chemical of mutual concern, and so we haven't started to assess where it falls in the, in the list of priority threats. Um, right now, our standards, say for drinking water, allow people to consume drinking water uh, with, for example, tritium at levels that are 360 to 700 times as high as we would any other toxic chemical in the Great Lakes. So the problem is that we're assessing these things against um, inadequate current standards. Uh, so we do need to take a good, fresh look at, at this question, and we need to look at the whole range of sites in the basin. So in that nomination that John was just mentioning, uh, we had uh, over 100 groups, both sides of the Canadian-U.S. border, agree that we want the two governments to nominate this as a chemical of mutual concern and do that assessment in view of the um, very large number of operating plants, legacy waste sites, legacy mining sites, and uh, legacy weapons sites that exist uh, all around Lake Erie, Lake uh, Huron, and Lake Ontario in particular. Okay, we will consider some of that in just a second. I now want to go to Mark and find out whether, what's your view on whether or not we have adequate studies in place that confirm that this is not a concern? Yeah, I, I obviously don't think we do because our organization, Lake Ontario Waterkeeper, signed on to the petition to have it included as a chemical of concern in the Great Lakes. And I, you know, I remember, um, I think it was 2004 or 2006, Ontario actually held um, what was called the Ontario Drinking Water Advisory Committee um, process here in downtown Toronto where 70 groups came and looked at things like tritium and the current standard for drinking water um, in Canada is 7,000 becquerels per litre. Um, the American standard is somewhere around 700. And so they got tougher standards than we do. Much more and then you get to this uh, provincial advisory committee and the province really looks after drinking water. Um, out of that report, which CNSC and the industry was heard from, they recommended 10 to 20 becquerels per litre as the standard. So even the Americans are too high. And now, yeah, and yet here we are almost a decade later and we still have the 7,000 becquerels per litre. And so when, you know, and it makes it difficult and, and for all of our groups really to get a handle on why we're not going to the stricter standards, particularly on the Great Lakes where we drink the water, and why the industry is, is pushing back on even the very simple idea of really just doing proper monitoring, making it transparent, putting it on a chemical, chemical of concern so we can look at the future of the Great Lakes and what we need to do to protect it. Like in Bordeaux, where they're spending, and give them credit, a billion dollars right now, you know, sealing up 
and protecting the Lake Ontario from the waste around that community. That's Which the, you, you support. Totally, and that's the biggest environmental cleanup in Canada going on right now. And so clearly there's a problem and there's a concern. Um, I think it's time now just to take the next step and really look at what the damage has been done to the Great Lakes and what we need to do further. Let me follow up with Michael on this. Okay. All right, we have two people here who are skeptics about the value of the studies that you say confirm that everything's fine. Why do you think the studies are fine when they clearly don't? So clearly um, we differ on, on the drinking water standard. For one, um, we do monitor and require monitoring of the intakes of municipal water treatment plants adjacent to nuclear power plants. And the tritium concentrations are extremely low. They're in the or just in the order of background to sometimes as high as 15 becquerels per liter. And that's important because the WHO, the World Health Organization, Health Canada, the province of Ontario have all said 7,000 becquerels per liter is the appropriate standard. And that's based on science that comes from the United Nations Scientific Committee on the effects of atomic radiation. So those who say 10 is better are of what? So I would say it, they've taken a different approach. Um, and it's only this committee that has recommended this low value here in Ontario. Um, they've recommended it um, about eight years ago for the province of Ontario and they haven't moved on this and they're still considering the so science. I, I and I would still like to add is the, you know, the level in the United States, 740 is widely acknowledged as math error from the 70s. They follow the same framework. However, there's no need for them to raise the number to based on the science that the rest of the world would consider um, because their industry like ours are meeting it. Um, we do our own environmental monitoring independently of industry and we publish this data on our website that clearly shows that the, the municipal water treatment plants immediately adjacent to these facilities is extremely low in terms of tritium. Teresa. So I just want to jump in on that. The Ontario Drinking Water Advisory Council was set up after Walkerton and consists of eminent scientists to advise the Minister of the Environment on drinking water Remind standards. everybody, I mean, Walkerton's a long time ago Walkerton already, so remind was everybody. Walkerton was the situation where the town of Walkerton's wells were uh, poisoned by pathogens and seven people died from drinking water. And thousands so more sickened. 2,500 were very ill. Yeah. So as a result of that, many things were put in place to protect sources of drinking water, barriers to protect drinking water. And one of the things was this council, which consists of scientists who advised the minister on drinking water standards. So they did a very thorough analysis based on a request by the minister after she received a request from Toronto's public health officer. And based on the science, they noted that radiological standards have been set in a certain way that is inconsistent with chemical standard setting. So chemical standard setting, we say, will allow for an excess cancer uh, incidence, uh, one in a million, whereas in the radiological standard setting, they're actually allowing for an excess cancer incidence, as I mentioned, at least 350 times higher, and an excess cancer death 70 times higher. So what Odwak said, this committee, is that it's not appropriate to have drinking water where people's health is treated differently just because the substance is coming from a different industry. Let me follow up with John. Do you have any evidence to date as to whether or not radionuclides are adversely affecting the drinking water that comes out of Lake Ontario? Uh, I haven't seen any, uh, any of that data. We don't, we don't uh, collect that data. It's Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And Do you trust data. them? Well, we have an agreement with them to work cooperatively. Uh, That's I have not no, what I asked. I, I, have, I have no reason to doubt the, the science that comes out of Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, no. Same as I trust the science that comes out of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, we have, uh, we have, we're a science-based department, and that's, that's our, one of our strengths. Do you trust the science that comes out of these organizations? Well, and I, I'm totally respectful of, you know, the scientists who work for the CNSC, but no, you know, I, I like to, I'm on the record as saying this, is you have more rights fighting a parking ticket in Ontario than you do fighting a permit to allow for radionuclides in Lake Ontario. Um, the CNSC has really dumbed down the process. We get 10 minutes. Um, no cross-examination, in front of a, a commissioners who the last time they ruled in favor of the public, Linda Keene, she was fired the next day. It's not like we're overly confident that what's going on at the CNSC is in the public interest. We feel, rightly or wrongly, and I think mainly rightly, that there is an over-bias to protect the industry and to promote it. And, um, you know, that's the way the public feels. That's the way many of us feel. And, you know, and someone who's fought parking tickets, and I was a criminal lawyer, and someone who's fought permits, I know that we have much less legal rights and due process fighting a permit to All put right. water. But, but so far, yeah, you, but 
Let me do one follow-up, and yeah. I'll come back. So far, you've told me you have lots of suspicion, but I mm. haven't heard you adduce any facts that say that what this guy's doing is dangerous. Well, I, it, it is hard to prove things, but yeah, I, you know, I think I proved the fact is that the welcome site, the Port Granby site, um, the monkey um, landfill in Port Hope, all of those are leaking into Lake Ontario, and I've sampled from them and brought that evidence forward, and the government has taken the right steps now, spending a billion two to cap and seal those sites. So clearly, you know, we know the stuff's going into the lake, and even the CNSC agrees now that it's not appropriate to put in the lake. So that's just factual, and the money speaks for itself in terms of the cleanup and the cost. Michael. So as an example for um, how someone like the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper could participate in our decision-making process, our public hearings, is we offer participant funding. Um, we, uh, we, it's true that we give a 10-minute opportunity for a summary. However, there's a written submission, and the commission reads every word before that. And we know that, be, that they come into this hearing process well-informed because for the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper's presentation last week in Port Hope, we spent an hour and a half on Q's and A's, still leaving on the same topic. So so I think it's unfair to say that we only give 10 minutes. We give many, many hours in consideration. And, uh, and frankly, I think the submissions from the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper are very helpful. We spend a lot of time studying them, and, uh, and it does guide us in certain ways. Are their scientists better than your scientists? Absolutely not, but they're very good. And I think that, um, that their advice and, and the, the challenge function that interveners pose is very helpful for uh, someone like the commission to consider. And it is true. I mean, the, the hearings last week we were involved in with Cameco's 10-year license in the Port Hope area initiative. Which was hearings into what? It, the Cameco is, makes the fuel for the can -do reactors, yeah. and it's in Port Hope. It's on the waterfront, and it's applying for a 10-year license, and we were involved in that, as well as the Port Hope area initiative cleanup, this, this billion-dollar cleanup. And last week, yes, I, th I think it was a very cordial. I mean, maybe it was because I wasn't there. As council, <laughs> <laughs> Teresa knows. Um, but yes, he's not that cordial. But, yeah. <laughs> but yes, they were. <laughs> yeah, yes, they um, they really did have a full hearing into these issues, and I felt that they were heard. But there, are, I you know I participated in, you know, twenty, thirty of these hearings, and oftentimes you just get shut down immediately. Um, and so it is arbitrary in terms of whether or not they hear you. The, the right is to ten minutes, but they can extend that. Um, but he says but, they read the reports before you, you're even there, so he knows what you're going to say. Yeah, I mean... Anyway, we don't have to believe this. You know, as a lawyer, you really do want to speak to those who are making decisions that affect your drinking water. You want to speak right to them, and you want to ensure that you ask the questions of the scientists who say it's safe. So that's what we try and do, and that's okay. the type of process I'd like to see in place. John, let me try this with you. If radionuclides were added to the list of things that they think you ought to be concerned about, what would that accomplish in your view? Well, uh, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, the identification of chemicals of mutual concern also then requires a binational strategy to be developed for each one of those. And the mutual refers to who? Canada, U.S. And the U.S., not the province of Ontario, not the state of New York, whatever. All those people are consulted along the way. Okay. Um, so uh, we have the first set of chemicals of mutual concern. There are eight uh, chemicals in that set, PCBs, mercury as legacy contaminants, and the other six are emerging contaminants, uh, flame retardants, and, and so on. If you put radionuclides on that list, what would it do? Right, so the binational strategy that comes out is to address any gaps that there are. What is it that we're not doing now that we think binationally could be done to address the situation? So that might be more research and monitoring. It might be more regulation, it might be more voluntary action, it could be a suite of risk management activities. Would that make you happy if that were to happen? Absolutely, yeah, because we're not doing that right now. We're not assessing the, the risks and range of issues that are um, present from this wide variety of facilities all around the Great Lakes. And just to answer your earlier question about whether we actually have evidence that there's an issue um, on the tritium question. There is tritium in the Great Lakes, and you know there what? is tritium in the drinking I've, water. I've let this go by f five or six references already, and I'm not, I shouldn't assume that everybody knows what tritium is and what it can do to you, so why don't you tell us? So tritium is one of the radionuclides that's particularly um, present with uh, can-do reactors. It has to do with the way hydrogen and water interact when it's um, exposed to radiation. And so it can start to decay, release energy, and if you've drunk it, it's within your body, it can cause a great deal of damage. So everyone is quite concerned about it, nobody wants too much Can you die water. from it if you drink it? 
Well, if you would develop cancer as a result of drinking high levels of tritium, then, then yes, could. absolutely. Yes. Okay. So, so the point is that the Ontario Drinking Water Advisory Council, and 20 years before that, another provincial council of scientists, said make the number 20. And we have drinking water intakes that quite frequently get up to a third of that, a half of that, or even exceed that level. Now, what the council said is you could do it annualized, and that'll be safe enough. Mm -hmm. So fine, do it annualized, but at least you need to be monitoring and paying attention to that number, not to the 7,000 Becquerels per Let me ask Michael about that. Is there adequate monitoring of that which he just described in the Great Lakes today? Yes, there is uh, adequate monitoring. I think over the last decade, through the industry uh, environmental monitoring reports, which they have to do un under our requirements. Uh, we have almost 10,000 water samples that have been analyzed. There's been more than 3,000 fish samples, been 3,000 plus sediment samples, and that's just in the last decade. So that's the type of evidence that we have to have a look at whether the fish safe, the water safe, the drinking water safe. Mark, that sounds like a lot. Is it adequate in your view? I think it's important to keep in mind two things with respect to that. You know, this is a fairly new chemical concern. It's not something, it is natural, but it's not at the levels that are now in our drinking water as a result of the nuclear industry. So, you know, there is evidence being built up. There aren't clear, hard, and fast conclusions you can draw. But if you use the precautionary principle, I don't think anybody would disagree that we should have the 10 to 20 becquerels per liter standard for our drinking water. Um, and I think we need much more. One of the big important things about TRISA's application while we signed on, and what I'm hearing from the IJC is that they will do a much better job, more independent, of doing the sampling, doing the monitoring, and getting it out to the public in a transparent way. All eight states, two provinces, two countries. You know, it's a very, it is a bi-national approach. And I think that's the type of science we need, you know, public science that's given in a transparent way so that we can have access to it and look at because. We just don't want to be wrong on this. I hear you, but are you saying the Nuclear Safety Commission's own sampling and analysis of those samples is somehow suspect? Well, yeah. it's not the whole Great Lakes region. Yeah. It, each facility does a certain amount of sampling in their immediate environment. Yeah. So, for example, at the Bruce plant, when there was a licensing hearing a couple of years ago, um, you know, they would have put in samples for their immediate environment. At the Deep Geological Repository hearings, in front of the Joint Review Panel, they asked that question, and the information they were provided back was 1990s IJC reports saying we haven't done a collective assessment, and a Bruce plant assessment that was just for the immediate area. So it's not being done on a broad ecosystem basis. It's just facility by facility, and then when there's a spill, this, this comes up, the answer will be, well, it's below drinking water standards, even if it's, you know, 6,000, Becquerels per liter, and it's because the drinking water standard is so high. This has actually happened. Okay, Michael, to you again. Is that a fair criticism that you're only concerned with sampling the water that's near your nuclear facilities as opposed to in the Great Lakes as a whole? So I think there's, uh, there's two types of sampling. Certainly from a compliance perspective, we require licensees to demonstrate that wherever their emissions may end up, that must be sampled, and it must be sampled beyond to ensure that emissions are not beyond the footprint that, that was predicted. That includes municipal water supplies immediately adjacent in the neighborhood of these facilities. Um, but we don't require them to go farther downstream because they've already demonstrated that the releases are not going that far. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't require a full uh, uh, Great Lakes watershed monitoring program, as an example. Industry does do it, but not under mm -hmm. our requirement. Mark, here's the thing. If we discover through all of this analysis and through all of the testing that there's a problem with these plants and there's too many radionuclides going in the water and it's harming our drinking water, what the heck are we going to do anyway? We depend on nucle for more than half of, you know, our electricity generation in this province. We can't very well just tell them all to turn themselves off while they figure this out, can we? Well, this is an easier question to answer because, yeah, the, the, the actual plants can control the amount of radionuclides they put into the Great Lakes. They follow the standards. So when you have standards that are ridiculously high, they're allowed to put a lot more into the Great Lakes. If, for example, the CNSC or you know, the province of Ontario required these plants to put less into the Great Lakes, they can do it. It'll cost them some more money. Um, and in, when it comes to the landfill, because like, we're just talking about the plants, but the old waste sites in Deloro, um, Port Granby, Port Hope, um, these 
you know, and the one they were talking about building on Lake Huron, these sites, they should be built to standards where those wastes are never released. That's the standard I'd like to see put in place, like Ontario has for hazardous waste sites. But um, it, they don't live up to that standard in these sites. They're improving, but they're still, because the standards are so weak, and it's not a chemical concern on the, on the Great Lakes, they're still able to allow higher levels into our drinking water. And so it's not a matter of shutting down the industry. It's a matter of taking more precaution to protect the drinking water. John, what's your view on whether the nuclear industry in this country should have to do that, meet that higher standard that Mark just referred to? Well, I mean, I, I would say that it is a really important question, this issue about monitoring and data coverage and what, what sort of basin-wide coverage do we have. And that's, that's one of the uh, reasons that we're taking a really close look at this n uh, nomination for radionuclides and really spending a lot of time uh, going through it, considering what data we have now, uh, what, uh, what would uh, a binational strategy add to it, what more could we do. One of the challenges our scientists have uh, looking at uh, all kinds of chemicals in air and water and sediment and fish and wildlife is, uh, is what do you do if you've been sampling for years and years and years and the levels are quite low? We have a, a, a budget for our science and monitoring. Uh, we want to make sure we're precautionary and we're uh, looking for new chemicals. So you might move that money somewhere else and go check for something that you think is a more urgent situation. It, yeah, it's possible. It sounds though, you tell me if I'm wrong about this. It sounds like you guys don't really lead the way on this. You kind of wait for your cue from other organizations and then essentially do what you're told. Is that right? No, not on, not on Great Lakes monitoring in general. Environment Canada has very strong uh, Great Lakes surveillance programs uh, where we look at, as they say, water quality, air quality, sediment, fish, biota. Uh, but on the issue of radionuclides, we're not leading. They, these guys are. That's right. Okay, uh, to, to Mark's point over here. Would there be value in the nuclear industry in this country spending more money and getting those standards tougher? So um, the standards I think we're talking about are, are drinking water quality standards. And so that's a provincial jurisdiction. They have to consider what that would be. Um, we do set standards for releases and for radiation protection, and they're based, based on ensuring protection of health. And one part of that standard is a concept called as low as reasonably achievable. And what that means is regardless of whether they're under um, a safe standard or not, we expect licensees to continually improve and adjust and optimize so that releases continually get lower and lower. And that's one of our main core programs for our regulatory oversight. And releases have been decreasing. Um, I think facilities have been improving. If you talk about Port Hope, there's construction of brand new state-of-the-art water treatment plants that are just being commissioned this month. And I think that there is continual improvement regardless of what the um, standard is for drinking water. You, you left yourself a bit of a loophole there, right? I mean, you use that word reasonably. Mm -hmm. So different people will sure. differ on what reasonable means. Right. So there is a cost balance and cost and effectiveness balance, absolutely. Um, but if we consider uh, that um, health effects for radiation are at a level of, I'll just use the number 100, and we set our regulation to be 100 times lower, so public must be protected to a value of one. Um, and then we rely on this as low as reasonably achievable to get below this limit. And they're now down at 1,000 lower than the actual limit that we require. Teresa, and continually is that, improving. Is that reasonable for you? This issue about what's reasonable with cost is actually pretty critical because there are lots of demands in terms of what the nuclear plants should be spending money on. Mm -hmm. We're also after them to improve emergency planning, to do potassium iodide distribution for in case of an accident, um, to uh, meet some of the Fukushima recommendations and, uh, and many other um, cost pressures. Um, the industry wrote to the Ontario Drinking Water Advisory Council when they did that consultation on tritium, uh, the Canadian Nuclear Society actually said it would not be a cost problem and that they could meet that standard. So it's been a bit of a mystery to me about why it hasn't proceeded since then um, because of the fact that we do see the rhetoric constantly um, saying, well, it's below the drinking water standard of 7,000, even though there have been uh, industry people at hearings saying, we could meet 20, we usually meet 20, it's not a problem for us to meet 20. But so they're not arguing that it's a cost issue. I see. Uh, you know John Jackson? Yes, I do. John Jackson's on your board. He's, he is, yeah. <laughs> Here's what he had to say about some of this. Shall we bring this up, please, Sheldon? What's important to remember is that radioactive materials are constantly on the move around and across the Great Lakes. Whether it is fuel being shipped from a processing facility to power plants, 
waste being moved to storage sites, or tritium being shipped to a factory, these materials aren't just sitting in one place. This opens up a real risk for accidental releases into the lakes themselves or into waterways that flow into the lakes. His expression is real risk. Right. Let's follow up on that. Michael, do you, how would you gauge the real risk? So I think that uh, first statement is correct, that uh, um, there's transport of nuclear substances continually. Millions of packages are sent every year around the world. Um, the uh, requirements for packaging is, are extremely important. And so Transport Canada has um, transports of dangerous goods regulations. We have our own regulations for packaging and, and transport. And so the reliance is on what sort of container are these materials in that go through extraneous testing. Um, and if you happen to look at the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's website, you'll see a YouTube video of, of the testing they have for their packages, where a train smashes into it, the train's damaged, the package is not. And so there's an extreme emphasis on what sort of material that, uh, um, based on risk, what sort of package it goes in, and those packages are safe. How would you gauge the level of the risk? Well, our organization um, was involved in the, in the hearing that looked into shipping um, the, the big steam turbines um, across the Great Lakes. And certainly I learned two things from that hearing. One is that there wasn't a clear identification of the drinking water facilities on the Great Lakes when they were shipping. They didn't know who would they have to phone if there was an accident to tell them to shut down their drinking water. And secondly, as they were using, as I referred to earlier in the show, the IAEA rules, which really... International Atomic, Atomic Energy, Energy Agency rules, okay. which really, you know, for the most part, deals with shipping on oceans. And so the Great Lakes are a special place. They're unique. And I think we need our own rules when we look at these issues of shipping waste. And I, I also think it's really important to keep in mind, when you use the concept of Alera, as low as reasonably achievable, it really underscores the importance of groups like CELA, groups like ours, John Jackson, um, Sean Patrick Stencil at Greenpeace, you know, to really question what is reasonable. Because if we aren't there questioning the standard, um, you know, it can, it can ultimately sway towards the industry without someone saying, hey, that's not reasonable. And that's what's the important part about process and having groups that are really watchdogs for the Great Lakes to make sure that that standard, because it's not fixed, doesn't slowly, you know, get to the point where reasonable becomes 7,000 becquerels per liter of tritium in drinking water. John, where are you on the reasonableness scale? Well, I would just say that... Uh... Um, I can't speak to the, the transport of nuclear uh, material around the Great Lakes, but I think most people know that there are trans there's transportation of all kinds of toxic chemicals by rail, by truck, uh, every day. So uh, the, the, the chemicals that we're dealing with are, are, are ubiquitous. Um, so I think there's, a, there's already a risk there, um, and what we're talking about is any additional new risk. Let me follow up on something you just said a few moments ago, which is if there were an accident or a spill into the Great Lakes, are we adequately ready to respond to that today in your view? No, if we're talking about the operating nuclear plants and a big accident like happened at Fukushima, which could happen here for some other reason, you can never say never, we are not ready. We have not come up with a contingency plan for drinking water for the millions of people on the Canadian side as well as the American side who rely on the Great Lakes. If you had some kind of an accident scenario, you probably have to be cooling the fuel. You probably have to be using Great Lakes water to cool the fuel, as happened in Japan. And so what are we doing with all that water and what's happening with the intake down the road that you have to close down and the water supply now for all of those people? You know, most water towers would only have a day, day and a half worth of water stored in advance and that's a lot of people to worry about so we've said to the province you need to be looking at that question in your emergency planning uh, three years ago the minister responsible said they would but they haven't done it yet as far as i know we've never had a fukushima like incident here right no but it could happen well, can do's are not immune anything could happen yeah absolutely but i remember when the when the you know what was the one in ukraine called again chernobyl chernobyl Remember when that happened, there was, you know, this immediate thing, well, it could happen here. Actually, it couldn't happen here, right? That couldn't happen. An accident you know? at a Canadian nuclear plant could happen where we could have a very large off-site release like Chernobyl or like Fukushima. The plant is different. It might be a different mechanism. Right. But we must never think we can't have an accident like that. It was like never supposed in, to in, happen in Fukushima. It, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it could happen here. This is the problem, that we're putting these plants in the middle of millions of people in Ontario. We're making decisions to rely 40% of, of our electricity supply, as you mentioned, 
on nuclear, and we have the oldest commercial operating plant in the world operating in the highest population density in the world okay. with inadequate emergency. I got planning. a minute left. I got to give it to the nuclear safety guy. So, <laughs> so I think I think that's a really good point. Emergency management is something that we have to plan for. We can talk about whether it can or could or would never happen. We have to plan for it like it will happen, and we're doing that. In fact, this week, um, the Japanese health authorities from the Fukushima prefecture and in my office back in Ottawa, and we're talking about lessons learned. The provinces there, many of the provinces that have uh, MPPs are there, about how best to coordinate and what lessons learned we can get from that disaster that we can incorporate into our regulatory framework. Gotcha. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in for this discussion. But a word, again, that I suspect 95% of our audience never heard until tonight. <laughs> Radio Nuclide, that's a good one. Okay, Michael Rinker, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, Teresa McClanahan, Canadian Environmental Law Association, Mark Matson, President, Lake Ontario Waterkeeper, John Marsden. You guys have very similar last names, you notice that? <laughs> Environment and Climate Change Canada. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.